welcome to another round with the Pacific Research Institute. PRI is a free market think tank headquartered in San Francisco. I'm your host, Rowena Ichon. Here on another round, we enjoy talking about California policy and California wine. So stay tuned to hear our guest recommendations for the best place to have beer or wine when you're driving through Long Beach. On this episode of Another Round, we're talking about education in California. There are serious concerns about whether California schools are producing the trained workforce that employers are seeking for the economy of the future. Career tech and blended learning, which combines technology and traditional classroom education, provide a great opportunity to give students a solid foundation for high-tech careers. Weighing in on this issue and others is Democratic Assemblyman Patrick O'Donnell of Long Beach. Assemblyman O'Donnell is a former classroom teacher and the chair of the Assembly Education Committee. He talked with PRI's Director of Communications, Tim Minaya, in his office at the State Capitol in Sacramento. Later, Lance Azumi, Director of PRI's Center for Education and a Coret Senior Fellow, will join Tim and me to chat about this issue further. Now here's Tim. Well, Assemblyman Patrick O'Donnell, thanks for joining us for another round with PRI. I'm sure you're finding this is a little bit of a surreal experience because we, uh, for our listeners there, Pat and I have known one another for God, almost 20 years now, and I bet you never thought back in the day when we were Assembly Fellows that one day we would be sitting here doing a podcast interview. No, I didn't. I didn't. But it's good to be here with you and the whole PRI team. So as we mentioned, you know, 20 years ago, we started as Assembly Fellows. Talk about your experience as a fellow and how that kind of shapes your career path and the type of lawmaker you are today. Well, my experience as a fellow was uh, awesome. It was life-changing. It's interesting. It wasn't like when I left the fellowship, the California State Assembly Fellowship, the Jesse Marvin Unruh Fellowship, that I said, hey, I want to become an assemblyman. Actually, it's probably quite the opposite because many fellows stayed, had a career inside the state legislature. Many are still here. Some are outside. Some are still very involved like you, of course. The fellowship really helped me see what California was like. It really educated me not only on process, but really the diversity in this state. When I talk about the diversity, uh, certainly in color, but also in geography, what a different state we are. And that gives gives us to have a diversity in philosophy as well. So out of the fellowship, I walked with many, walked away with many things. Certainly the legislative process, knowing how to influence the legislature, knowing how to work within the legislature, but also a great appreciation for how different this state is. So before you were elected to the assembly, you served for many years on the Long Beach City Council. And you know from your time there, partisanship is kind of second nature. You know, you're really working across, you don't even think about that. You're really working together to get things done done. And the opposite, sadly, is true. You know, once you get to Sacramento, what do you take from that experience to your time here in Sacramento? And what do you think can be done to bridge the partisan divide and Sacramento encourage that kind of spirit of common ground? Let me first start by saying I appreciate the partisan divide. It's natural that we're going to have a partisan divide, given that we have two major parties in our country and, in fact, our state. So I see the partisan divide, again, as something that's very natural. Sometimes it is to be bridged. Sometimes it is not, because we have of different philosophies. But I, I, I see myself as a bipartisan guy, both inside this building and outside this building. In my personal life, I have many friends that are not Democrats, many that are declined to states, independents, if you will, many that are Republicans, many that voted for Trump, many that did not, many that voted for Hillary. So again, outside this building, I leave a very bipartisan life, uh, given the people that I hang out with that aren't really involved in politics every day. Inside the building, I think I'm able to build personal relationships with a very bipartisan in nature. Uh, Hopefully on legislation, I can do that as well. On the Long Beach City Council, I learned that I did have to work across the aisle with people that have different philosophies, different mindsets, if you will. Long Beach is a great microcosm of this state. It's a great microcosm of what goes on in the state legislature. The business community is engaged. The labor community is engaged. The environmental community is engaged in Long Beach. We have a multi-billion dollar budget. When the budget crisis hit in about, what, 08? Listen, we had to lay off about 800 people people cut about 800 positions. So again, that gave me, I would say, great experience, but also great expertise, if you will, in reaching out to others and building those coalitions, bipartisan or not, to move policy initiatives forward.
One of the things that, you know, you've certainly noticed since coming to the Assembly is there are many legislators who previously served in local government, whether at the city or county level, whether Democrat or Republican, many share the same frustrations when serving in local government about being handcuffed by Sacramento when it comes to decision making. So what are your experiences on that front? And are there any areas where you would like to see Sacramento maybe loosen the strings a little bit and allow for more local control? I think it doesn't only have to do with local experience at the, at the elected level. I think it has to do with life experience. Uh, what I really appreciate uh, in Sacramento is when a legislator comes here and has had life experience. What do I mean by life experience? I mean a job outside of politics for many years. That allows one to have uh, a worldly experience that we can use up here. Because what happens sometimes when you step into this building is you think this world is about the state capitol. And I can assure you that uh, my constituents aren't waking up every morning wondering who their assembly member is, unless they're upset. <laughs> so really, you need to bring that mindset here because I think that's very valuable. I, I'm not a big believer in micromanaging from Sacramento. I'll, I'll let that you know bleed over into my experience as a classroom teacher. I now chair the education committee up here in the state assembly. And I'm a firm believer that success happens through innovation and hard work at the local level. It's not going to be driven by Sacramento. So again, that's the experience I bring, that we don't micromanage other governmental entities entities or even any entity from the Sacramento. You talk a little bit about your classroom experience and I think that's very, I haven't gone back and done the research, but I'm sure it's probably kind of unique that you've gone from the classroom to chairing the Assembly Education Committee. Talk about your time in the classroom and how that shapes your view as a legislator and as chair of the Education Committee. Well, let me first start off by saying there's a significant disconnect between what's going on in the classroom and what's going on in Sacramento. Listen, California teachers are working hard every day to see their students succeed. California is doing better in many ways than it ever has on the education front. We're sending more kids to colleges. We're seeing more success, more high school graduates. Now, we do have some challenges. We have that persistent achievement gap, which we're trying to address. And we know that we can often draw a zip code, uh, a link between, a nexus between a zip code and how a student succeeds. So that's, we're trying to find that code, trying to crack that dynamic so that we can fix that challenge. That is been here for many, many years. It isn't something new. Listen, we have 51% of California students live in poverty. Two-thirds come from homes that often speak a language other than English. So that brings us significant opportunity, but also significant challenges. So that's the kind of experience I bring from the local level. And I think that's the kind of experience that matters. Again, that, that, that we don't create, let me put this, we don't pass 2,000 laws that dictate everything that happens in the classroom because that is not going to uh, solve our, our problems or meet our challenges. Again, it has to happen at the local level. What we need to do in Sacramento is set the bar, give the locals the resources, and let them design the path to get higher than that bar. You know, one big challenge for our economy is ensuring that the students that we're graduating today and in the future are a trained worse workforce and are prepared to meet the demands of an economy that changes by the day. And part of that ensure is ensuring that we inspire graduates to go into teaching and teach into those high demand fields like science and math. I know this has been an important legislative priority for you. Can you talk about your work in these areas and why you think um, this area is important for our economic future? California has to have a well-trained workforce for our future economy. California has a creative economy and that requires creative minds. That requires uh, a multitude of skill sets, math, science, STEM, other, other skill sets as well. So they're very important to the future of California's economy. Listen, we're an innovation based economy. We're not an economy where people go to factories and people go to a farm every day and do repetitive things. We're a place where people, again, are creating every day in their open office of an environment. So what does that mean for California? That means first we got to have a qualified, we need to have a teacher workforce that's prepared to meet those demands. And right now we don't. Our teacher credential programs in the state of California are down about 70% in the number of students attending. So what does that mean? It means we don't have a big bank of readily trained teachers that we can put into the classrooms. And we need more trained teachers uh, in that bank because what's happening is we have many, uh, many of the baby boomers are starting to retire and we're not going to be able to replenish those ranks unless we have a, a large core 
of well-trained teachers that are ready to go into the classroom. Again, we don't have that in California. So what I'm trying to do is incentivize people to become teachers. There's a couple way I'm, ways I'm doing that. One is AB 169, which is a grant program, a scholarship program for people who desire to become teachers to incentivize them to get through a teacher education program, as well as the bachelor portion of, it, of, of that teacher education component. And also AB 170, which I think is kind of interesting, and that's to repeal a Sputnik era law. It's from the 1960s. Uh, that was a law that said California colleges can't offer a degree in education. So this again would repeal that law so that our colleges across California could offer a four-year education degree. And why do you want a four-year education degree? I think it's particularly important at the K-8 level, maybe the K-6 level. Not so much at the high school level where the content is more heavy, where it's chemistry or math, but certainly at the lower levels where the art of good teaching is so important. And so if you had a four-year education degree, a student could see the art of good teaching over those four years progressively and get into the classroom and, and learn how to deal with kids, learn how to motivate children, and see it from the experts in the classroom every day, rather than just teaching the treating the credential as an an off year, a segregated one year experience. We infuse it over four years. So I think that's a positive step to replenish our teacher course. There's going to be, it's going to take a lot of work. It's not going to be easy. Right now, the, the fact is a lot of people don't want to become teachers. Certainly there's economic reasons. Teachers don't make a tremendous amount of money and it costs a lot of money to become a teacher. But also we need to look at the political environment and what's happening. People are blaming teachers for everything. Uh, teachers are handed kids in kindergarten and expected to solve every challenge that child has outside of the school and in the school by the first test, which is usually in second or third grade. So that's an unfortunate circumstance and something we need to recognize, what kind of dynamic we've set up where so much pressure is put on teachers to help their students succeed. The fact of the matter is teachers are being held accountable for the success of their students, and certainly they play a role in the success of their students, but they also need to recognize that sometimes students come with such great challenges that you just can't put all of that student success on the teacher's back. When talking about preparing students and Californians to meet the demands of the economy, career tech education plays an important role in that. Back in the day, we called it vocational education, especially with very crowded public colleges and universities. Career tech takes on an even more important role. I know that this has been an important priority for you as well. So what are your thoughts on the state of career tech in California today? And what, if anything, more or different should we do on that front? Today, the state of California gets a C for its efforts in a career tech technical education. Ten years ago, it would have been an F. So we're improving. The good thing is we're improving. Listen, 25 years ago, uh, California set forth on a new path. What we said was every child is going to a four-year university. This is 25 years ago. Did it work? No. Because not every child is going to a four-year university, nor should every child go to a four-year university. Children need multiple paths to success. And what I saw in my own classroom experience as a high school teacher was students fall off the path path to success because there wasn't anything at school that engaged and often career technical education engages students not every student but certain students and we as a state have an obligation to provide that to the student but also to the future California economy the fact of the matter is that many many jobs go wanting because we don't have the necessary skill sets to fulfill them and many of those skill sets can be developed at the high school level and beyond so my top priority next year is to continue funding for career technical education in the state of California and I think it should be quite frankly the, the top priority of every California state's legislator you're gonna see a major push for this next year and why a major push next year well, over the last several years, about three years, we funded career technical education. We've given money to the local levels to fund career technical education. That money is set to expire this year, meaning next year it will not be in the budget. So I'm going to work hard to make sure that money gets back into the budget and more money than we've been putting in there. Because we put a decent amount of money in there from 300 to 200 million every year, but it needs to be more because these are very capital intensive programs. For the last 25 years, right, we didn't do anything. All of a sudden, school districts got engaged by us offering money. We incentivized them to provide career technical education, and we need to continue to incentivize them to provide career technical ed education through money. And that's, again, going to be my biggest push next year. One area where PRI has done a lot of scholarship and where we found brings a lot of people who may not be interested in policy together is blended learning or classroom technology. We had uh, an event in San Francisco 
Francisco a couple of months ago where brought together all these people from the tech world and from different walks of life who you wouldn't think would all be together on the same stage at the same time. These are programmers and people interested in, you know, helping give kids from underserved communities, uh, you know, a chance. And as we've done our work on this, we found one of the things when we're talking about making sure teachers get the support that they need, that one of the challenges with um, classroom technology is making sure that either as part of the teacher curriculum or whatever that teachers are really given the foundation they need to put classroom technology to use in the classroom. We're just, just giving them a whole bunch of iPads and saying, go. Kind of what are your thoughts on the potential for classroom technology? And are there any areas where you see the legislature playing a role on that issue? I absolutely believe the legislature has a role in providing classroom technology. We provide the money. The school districts provide the logistics and the associated technology for the student to walk to school. Listen, it, you know, it, it's 2017. The tools of the workplace should be the tools taught in the classroom. Every student should have an iPad or some other device, a Chromebook, whatever you call it, whatever it may be, that they should walk to school with. I always say, blow up the book room, but keep the library. All the books should be on that computer device. And why do I say that? Because in a, in a classroom setting, I want to use these kinds of tools in my class. And they should be blended into the classroom experience. And I hope we have the same definition of blended learning. Blended learning to me is where we blend technology into the daily experience of the California student. How can technology play a role in the classroom? It can play a role in many ways. Again, the books can be on the computer device that the students bring to school. Computers can also play a role. The technology can also play a role in engaging students in the classroom. Listen, the, the fact of the matter is you know, students today don't need to be a master of information. They need to be a master of how you find information. And that's what that technology piece in the classroom plays a role in. Also, when you think about learning, uh, when a teacher delivers content, what you're looking for students is then to show you that they've mastered that content. Technology can play a role in that. How can technology play a role in that? Students can be making commercials, graphic arts, gaming, videos, etc., based on the information they've learned in the classroom. So I really see technology as a very strong tool. I'm not afraid of it. And I think you know, California needs to do a better job in providing technology to its students and its teachers. When we talk about technology training to teachers, we need to do a better job at that. But first, the teachers need the technology. What I've seen in some instances is the training's offered, but there's no technology to back it up. So the training's largely irrelevant. And teachers are, are good people. They want to do a good job. And the more you provide them technology and these opportunities, they're going to seize upon them because they know they're going to help their California student be successful. Finally, I'm going to ask you the question that we ask all of our guests here on Another Round. So we call our podcast Another Round because California is home to such great wine and all of the hosts of Another Round enjoy drinking a lot of wine. So I'm going to let you play tour guide for your assembly district. So if we're going to come down and visit your district, what's the place that, uh, you know, should be the must visit place, either the best winery or best brew house or somewhere like that? Oh, well, there's many places in the 70th Assembly District you, sh you should visit. Uh, if you're driving through Long Beach, you'll have to visit the shoreline. There's many restaurants. Uh, there's marinas along there. It's a very beautiful coastline. You'll have to stop at Joe Joe's for sure. That's a famous Long Beach beer bar that's been there for about 92 years, I believe, if I'm correct now. Uh, further heading uh, up the road, you're going to stop at Curly's in Signal Hill, which is a, which is a great, well-known world famous place and then you're going to head down the freeway and you're going to cut down the 710 you're going to drive through the two ports you're going to go over two very large bridges where very large ships pass underneath and you're going to go into San Pedro which is which is a wonderful community with many shops many restaurants a great place to be and then you're going to jump on a ferry and you're going to head out to Catalina Island and you're going to spend the day on Catalina and you're going to see again just a great experience maybe you go on a bike ride rent a bike you can rent a golf cart you can go see the buffalo you can go snorkeling you can go zip lining 70 is Assembly District is a great place and it's what California is all about. Well, Assemblyman O'Donnell, we're definitely going to come and visit you in the 70th Assembly District and we really thank you for your time and talking with our uh, listeners here on another round. Great to be with you. Thanks very much for a great interview, Tim. Now, this is a time, um, we're calling this Last Call, where the PRI team gives uh, their thoughts on the guest interview. Um, I have here today uh, Lance Zumi, who is our Senior Director of Education Studies. I thought some of Assemblyman O'Donnell's comments on career tech and uh, recruiting teachers kind of fits in with um, a study that Lance did a year or two ago. We call it Not As Good As You Think, The Myth of the Middle Class School. And Lance's findings on math performance in the high schools and how dismal it was over many states across the board. Can you talk a little bit about that, Lance? 
Yes, uh, th th that's right, Ro. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, this series of studies that I did, which actually started with a book actually here in uh, looking at California, middle class and more affluent schools, but which then became a series of five large studies involving New Jersey, Texas, Colorado, Michigan, and Illinois. Uh, we looked at the performance of students on their state tests in mathematics and in English. And, you know, these middle class and affluent students who you'd expect to, you know, do pretty well end up in many cases not performing proficiently in these two subjects, but especially in mathematics. And so uh, you found that, uh, you know, often, you know, majorities of students, you know, in different grades uh, in these middle class schools were not performing at the proficient level on, uh, on math. And so it goes then to the issue uh, that uh, Assemblyman O'Donnell uh, discussed about, you know, trying to recruit, you know, good, you know, math and science teachers. And, uh, you know, I agree with him. We need those uh, good teachers in those subjects. Now, the problem is, is why is it that we don't have them to begin with? Uh, the, one of the reasons which the Assemblyman unfortunately did not mention is the fact that, you know, California and many, many other states, because uh, teachers are paid through union contracts, those union contracts uh, require uniform salary schedules for teachers regardless of subject. So for example, a teacher in uh, physical education, English, mathematics, uh, or physics are paid the same uh, salary regardless of the demand for those uh, particular subjects. And you know, we all know that uh, the demand for these uh, science and uh, math teachers is often greater than the demand for the teachers in, let's say, uh, the humanities, you know, because they, they can get go and get uh, jobs in uh, industry much easier. And so, unfortunately, districts can't pay them uh, higher uh, salaries because their hands are tied by uh, these uniform salary schedules negotiated with the teachers' unions. Well, Lance, I have a couple of kind of rapid fire, quick hit questions for you based on some of the things that he said that really dovetails some of your ongoing work. Um, the first was, uh, I was interested in getting your thoughts on the Assemblyman's comments on local control. Yeah, you know, local control, and I certainly agree with the Assemblyman O'Donnell on the importance of local control. You know, I think that's something he talked a lot about bipartisanship. And I think that if you ask, you know, uh, Democrats and Republicans, they will often tell you that uh, you know, they support local control in education. And so that's terrific. But what does local control mean? I, you know, I certainly have, uh, you know, told uh, members of both parties that local control doesn't mean simply local control of education and resources by local Local school districts, you know, uh, transferring power and decision making from the federal government to the states to local uh, districts is really uh, transferring policy making power from one level of bureaucracy to another. And oftentimes, the power players in central offices in school districts are just as distant as if they were at the U.S. Department of Education in Washington. Real local control is parental control. It's like it's uh, you only get the ability to make the decision over the future uh, learning of your child uh, if you as a parent have the ability to take that money to whichever school situation, whether it be public, private, charter, whatever, and uh, uh, be able to spend that money on behalf of your child to get the education that he or she deserves and which meets the, their individual needs. Given your uh, many years of experience on the California Community College's Board of Governors, I thought his proposal about offering four-year education degrees was an interesting one. I'm sure you have some thoughts on that. Well, you know, yes, I do, Tim. And, uh, you know, it certainly sounds good. You know, I mean, I, I, and again, I, I applaud uh, Assemblyman O'Donnell for, you know, to thinking about these issues. I think one of the things, though, is that uh, a number of years ago, I did a study for or the Pacific Research Institute called the, the Facing the Classroom Challenge. We looked at the curriculum that teachers, uh, pr prospective teachers at uh, university schools of education in the California State University system have to uh, take in order to get that credential to allow them to become teachers. And what you find is that the uh, types 
of instruction that those teachers get is really not related at all to what the research data shows is actually successful in terms of improving the learning and uh, proficiency of children, certainly in the core subjects. Given that, what is a four-year degree in education therefore going to look like in terms of how those uh, teachers uh, or those students who get that degree, what are they going to get for those four years? Is it going to be just more of the same that we see in these schools of education? Those are the bigger questions that we need to ask. Is whether we want simply more teachers or do we want more effective teachers in the classroom? Because that eventually is going to be what those parents are going to want. And then finally, we talked with Assemblyman O'Donnell about blended learning, which I know is an issue that you've done a lot of work on. What are your thoughts and what he had to say about that? Now, I certainly agree with uh, Assemblyman O'Donnell when it comes to, uh, he's he supported uh, blended learning, and I'm, I'm very glad he, he does. Uh, blended learning is, uh, you know, being able to take technology, uh, whether it's hardware like uh, computers and software uh, that uh, new education applications and use that in schools, you know, and combine that with traditional classroom instruction to, you know, uh, form a new type of uh, learning environment for kids that ends up uh, allowing them to learn more and to be able to be better prepared for higher education and for the workforce. So I certainly agree with him uh, there. I think the, the the thing where I would caution, and if we're going to do blended learning correctly and effectively, and I've written several books on blended learning now, we need to be able to, first of all, give teachers the type of instruction in their preparation to become teachers and those in the profession need to get proper professional development to be able to use these tools effectively. And one of the things I wrote in one of my books is that uh, only 5 to 10 percent of teachers are so prepared right now. And if you look at the curriculum of uh, teacher training programs, you know, very few of them have any meaningful, any meaningful technology component in there. So how can you simply give iPads to people? You know, when the teachers that are being churned out by the schools of education are totally unprepared to be able to use these uh, instruments uh, or to be able to understand the type of software that is associated with them. We need to be able to look at both sides of that equation. Thanks, Lance and Tim. And thanks to all of our listeners who stayed um, with us through the last call. To stay up to date with Assemblyman O'Donnell, follow him on Twitter at ASM Pat O'Donnell. And don't forget to follow PRI on Twitter at Pacific Research. If you like our podcast, tell your friends and encourage them to subscribe in iTunes and leave us good feedback. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll come back again for another round with PRI.